Good morning, everyone. Um, and for those of you joining us from the UK and Europe, uh, good afternoon. We are so thrilled to have you with us today. Uh, my name is Christine Fabin, and I am a partner and the co-lead of Hush Blackwell's Global Mobility and Business Immigration Law Group. Uh, before we begin, the events team has asked me to cover a few housekeeping items. Um, they have given me a handy dandy script to read off of. Uh, I promise I will not read from a script any other time in this presentation, um, but bear with me for a second as I kind of just read some of our housekeeping rules. So at the bottom of your audience console, there are multiple applications icon icons for your use during the program today. Um, if you have any questions during the webcast, please submit via the question box. We will try to answer all of the questions that come up during the webcast today, but if a fuller answer is needed or time runs out, um, we will answer you later via email. Uh, a PDF of the presentation is available in the program materials folder. Uh, and this program has been approved for legal education hours and HR credits, including HR, CI, and SHRM. To report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. A certificate of attendance, including course numbers, will be emailed to you tomorrow, along with a recording of the webcast for watching and sharing. Towards the end of the program, be sure to complete our short survey. Uh, we use your feedback to plan future programs that are applicable to your business needs. Uh, joining me today is Joanne Hennessy, immigration partner at TLT. Joanne is based in Scotland and is my personal trusted go-to for all things UK immigration law. Uh, her expertise include securing and maintaining UK sponsor, sponsor license, identifying appropriate UK immigration routes for employees and securing UK visas, along with a whole bunch of other things as they pertain uh, to UK immigration and foreign nationals. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Joe um, to let us kick off the, the next hour. Thanks again for joining. Thanks, Christine. Okay, so yeah, nice to have you all with us um, this afternoon or this morning for those of you in the States. Um, so what are we going to look at today? Well, we're going to give you a bit of a canter through um, some comparisons of UK and US immigration law today. Um, so firstly, we're going to look at business visitors, a really common question that Christine and I will both get in terms of what visitors to our jurisdictions can and can't do, how long they can stay. And then for those situations where actually visit rules just don't go far enough we're going to look at those general business visa options. Not all of them, or we'd have you here all day, but we're going to look at some of the key ones that you might want to look at and the kind of key um, considerations. And then finally, we'll have some time at the end for some questions that you may have, and hopefully we can try and address them today. So first of all, I'm going to kick off looking at visitors. Um, one of the first questions that comes up quite often um, is well, how long can visitors come to the UK? And it'll be the same in the US, I'm sure, Christine. And quite often the UK rules are confused with those in wider Europe. Um, so in terms of how long you can stay in the UK, the general rule is visitors can come and stay for up to six months per visit. Now, not per year, but per visit. That said, the visit rules in the UK are very much about intent and what a visitor intends to do, why they're here, what their plans are, what activities they propose to carry out in the UK. So depending upon the specific nature of a visit and what somebody wants to do, it may be that an immigration officer actually has an expectation of a shorter visit of maybe a couple of weeks or a month, for example. Um, so that intention to kind of leave at the end of a visit, not base yourself here long term or through frequent or successive visits and something that may require a work visa, which we'll, we'll come on to, um, is really one of the key considerations. How does that compare for you in the States, Christine? Yeah, that's a great question. So like the UK, intent is very, very important. Um, but unlike the UK, 180 days, which is six months, is the absolute max someone can acquire in a year. Um, any specific single trip can be only 90 days, um, preferably much less. Uh, so I know that we've had a lot of questions from individuals who are 
wanting to enter for, you know, 89 days, leave for a weekend and then re-enter for another 89 days. The, because of that intent piece, there, there are going to be some questions that do arise. Um, but overall, the general rule is 90 days max in any small trip, um, 180 days in any calendar year. So I guess with that, talk, talk to me a little bit about what types of activities, what, what, is, uh, what is the UK looking at when they're looking at activities and intent? What kind of falls under that umbrella in the business space? Yeah, so it's a bit of a thorny issue in the UK, actually. We've got published immigration rules that we kind of stick to. I would say some of them, for certain, in certain respects, are quite opaque in terms of how they're drafted. There's not that much guidance. And so we are left kind of navigating when we think something can be can comfortably fit in the visitor rules and when maybe it's straying beyond the parameters of what's permitted. Um, in terms of, gen we're purely focusing on business visits here, so obviously there's various rules for coming in to get married, have medical treatment, etc. that we won't, we won't cover here. But in terms of business visits, there are generic business activities that can be done, so things like attending meetings, conferences, negotiating contracts, things like that. They're all okay as a visitor. Um, they would generally be expected to be pretty short term in duration, so maybe a couple of weeks for things like that, not a full six months. There is specific provision for intergroup activities. So you maybe have a multinational organisation and say you have a team from the States or individuals from the States that want to come into the UK for a visit. They can come in and collaborate and troubleshoot um, on a, an internal group project during that time. But what you wouldn't be expecting them to do is client facing work, providing services or working from a client site, for example. Um, and that would really be expected to be short duration again. So certainly not as long as six months, anything like that. You're straying into, well, what's happened to your job overseas? Why are you in the UK for so long? Um, similarly, the one that everyone's kind of clinging to at the moment is this provision for um, overseas manufacturers or suppliers of things like goods, equipment, um, software, for example, um, to be able to come into the UK. And there is provision that if, if an overseas contractor has a contract with the UK business to provide goods or equipment or, or even after sales servicing in the UK, they can provide their team, they can send them into the UK to do that. But that would be, again, expected to be really short duration. And you'd really be looking at, you know, up to a month, probably maximum for that beyond your kind of strain beyond that. And that's become one that really risen to prominence post Brexit in the UK. Um, we're seeing really recurring queries from European contractors in particular saying, you know, I've got this contract to deliver these services or install this machinery in the UK. How do I get my staff in now? They don't have free movement anymore. And so I think that's one category that's we're straying into it being abused now, and we are seeing more people being challenged in the UK. Well, what are you doing? What's happening to your role in Europe, in the States, whatever? Um, so it is quite it is quite tricky. Um, and I think you need to be quite careful. We'll come on to the kind of risks of breaching the rules later. Um, but we are seeing visitors being challenged increasingly, and that causes challenges for them and for businesses. Uh, and quite often in these situations, you are straying into, well, if you just want to bring rotating groups of staff in to work on these projects, you're really looking at needing more of a work visa to do that kind of thing. Um, and training's a final one that's probably a one that's commonly used. If you have um, someone coming to the UK to get training for their job overseas, if that's training they can't get in their home country, they would be able to come in as a visitor to receive that in the UK. Similarly, you might have an overseas organisation engaged to provide training to a global group of businesses and if part of that groups in the UK they could come here to deliver that training but again you're really looking at one month so we're always kind of looking at well in principle you can come for six months but in reality the border force officials in the UK will expect you to be coming for a much shorter period and um, so it is it's a tricky area and we're going to look at who needs a visit visa and who doesn't but there's always an argument of if you just think it doesn't quite look right and it doesn't smell right and we're probably going beyond the visitor rules, yeah. probably apply for a work visa or stress test it by applying for a visit visa and just wait and see if they approve it beforehand yeah. so you've got a bit of certainty. How does that kind of shape up compared to the position in the States? It's pretty similar. Um, what I will tell you, though, and, and kind of a sticking point, especially now that, you know, borders have opened back up and we're seeing this influx of business yeah. travel, um, a constant conversation that I'm having with my clients is that 
I think that they sometimes don't understand that the individuals that are entering for business purposes on visitor type visas or ESTA waivers, mm -hmm. um, they have to be employed by an entity abroad. Um, and the work that they conduct in the U.S. has to be done for the benefit of the foreign entity. So, so there's none of this like come over for four weeks and we'll pay you a paycheck to come mm -hmm. over for a short amount of time. Um, that's going to get rejected at the port of entry. Um, and there's also none of this, you know, we have someone that's employed with us abroad that we want to come over to work for the U.S. entity, which is also issuing their paycheck. Um, there are sometimes like creative ways that we can get around that, um, but for the mm -hmm. most part, when we're talking about business visitors who are entering the U.S., we're really talking about those individuals who work for a company abroad, who are entering by invitation of the U.S. company, um, to not engage in day-to-day -day duties, but to do really specific nuanced tasks that are kind of outlined for us under the umbrella of the visitor's visa. Um, so those things similarly, you know, negotiating contracts, um, consulting with business associates, maybe entering for very short-term conferences, um, training gets a little tricky because there's actually a separate visa for those individuals that are wanting to enter um, when they're wanting to spend the majority of their time in, in training. Mm -hmm. um, we do have an after sales provision um, similar to the UK. I would say the, the one big thing to keep in mind with the after sales provision is that one, we have well, two big things. One, we have to be under contract, um, and that, ha that after sales provision has to be in the sales contract. And then two, the equipment that the individual is entering the U.S. to work on must have been manufactured abroad. So it can't be equipment that's manufactured here that we're bringing people in from outside to work on. Um, so pretty, pretty similar, but with some, you know, maybe additional nuances. Uh, so I guess in terms of who, who you would recommend getting a visa, and I, I know that we have a, a visa question that we want to talk about and an ESTA question. I don't know if those go hand in hand for the UK or if they're kind of, you know, mm. one and the same. How do, how do you think about those two things? In terms of yeah, and, just, and, just, and just for a context, was it just like that? Yeah, in terms of the do's and don'ts, I think we are pretty similar there. And your sort of starting point in the UK is always you shouldn't be working here, you can't be employed and paid here. Yeah. So it's kind, of, it's kind of unless it's expressly permitted. And then these sorts of scenarios on the slide there, you're, you're kind of you can't do this. Um, right. And yeah, then we stray into so who who actually needs a visit visa? And we've got um, two different kind of camps that you'd put people into coming into the UK. You've got your visa nationals and your non-visa nationals. So your non-visa nationals would include, for example, Europeans, US nationals, who don't need a visit visa in advance of arrival to the UK. So they can seek entry to the UK on arrival, but that they are still subject to the visit rules. And I think that's something people forget is because you don't need to apply for a visa and get express permission to come in. It's you know fair game, you can do what you want when you're here. You are still subject to those restrictions. And it is kind of dangerous because they're not then um, front and centre in your mind and brought to your attention because you're not expressly applying for a visa. Um, visa nationals are those nationalities that do always need to seek entry clearance before they come, so they would need to apply for a visit visa. So there's a, a big, long published list, but for example, people from Egypt, India, Morocco, China, for example, um, would need to be seeking a visa in advance. In terms of that process, that's an online application. They would attend an appointment usually provide their biometrics um, and then await their visa being approved um, the time scales vary it should be within about three weeks we have seen over the last year that wildly fluctuate um, these applications to the uk generally were really hampered by the ukraine war and understandably the focus and the priorities of the uk home office being directed to ukrainians seeking entry to the uk so um, it's kind of your luck where you're applying from for visit visas and whether you can fast track it at any given time. Um, so you could have people in the States applying to come to the UK, but they might not be US nationals, so they may still need to apply 
for that kind of visit visa in advance. Um, and you can get a one-off six-month visit visa, or you can get a longer-term month multiple entry. So I think it's two, five, or, or 10 years that you can seek. So the costs vary accordingly. So you're looking at between about 100, 115 pounds and just under a thousand pounds at the upper end for those kind of um, visit visas. So I, I would come back to that point, I suppose that even if you're a non-visa national and you don't technically need a visit visa, if you fall into one of those categories where you think, oh, I'm kind of pushing the boundaries of what a visitor can do here, or if you've got a dubious immigration record with the UK or certain criminal convictions, then absolutely my advice would be apply for a visit visa anyway, and then you're stress testing it. You're not making that trip kind of, you know, biting your nails on the plane thinking, will I be allowed into the country? And we get so many calls of people detained at Heathrow and turned away. So that would give you, you and your business kind of peace of mind. And how, how does that compare for the States? It's pretty similar. Um, I would uh, kind of, right? Because <laughs> the US and our immigration laws are a bit more, um, they're a bit more archaic, I think, than the UK. Mm -hmm. So I, here's what I will tell you. I would say that the vast majority of the UK nationals who I work with, um, if they are entering on some sort of, uh, because of some sort of business travel as a visitor, they're usually always entering on ESTA. Um, and what ESTA really is, is it's a waiver um, because the vast majority of nationals from other countries, um, especially those outside of Europe, do require a physical visa that is obtained from a consulate abroad um, where the, it's a whole rigmarole. You've got to fill out an application online. You've got to wait for an appointment. You've got to go to the consulate and um, have an appointment where you discuss your intent to come back to your home country and not overstay your time in, in the US, et cetera, et cetera. It's also quite a lot more expensive. So for certain countries, including the UK, there is this option to get that visa waived, but it is still a process that you have to undergo. Um, and you do have to get an approval for the ESTA before trying to enter the US. So unlike the UK, it's not as easy as like bringing your passport to the port of entry and just like crossing your fingers that they don't find anything in your background. Um, that check happens upfront before, preferably before you book your flight. Um, that's what I would tell everyone. Don't risk it, just get your ESTA. Um, the ESTA is, I think it's like $21 or something, very minimal. Mm -hmm. um, something I learned though recently is that British citizens have to have a permanent residence, either in England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, the Channel Islands, or the Isle of Man, which I didn't actually know was a place before I read this rule. So <laughs> I'm learning things every day in immigration. I feel like I learned something. Um, so that's that's ESTA. It's, it's super easy. Um, so long, again, as you don't have some sort of, you know, criminal record that's going to flag mm -hmm immigration authorities, if for some reason your ESTA does get denied, as a UK national at that point, you probably have to go through the song and dance of getting a proper visa and go through the consulate to obtain that. Um, and if that's the case, you know, you'll, you'll want to bring letters to address whatever the issues were. Um, but that's, that's kind of what the ESTA slash visitors visa looks like in the US. Yeah, and that's that's kind of the direction we're going in the UK. So um, ETA, the Electronic Travel Authorization of Reference on the slide there, and, and that's what we're starting to introduce, so kind of our equivalent to ESTA. So the non-visa yeah. nationals, your US nationals, for example, that don't need a visa at the moment, still won't, but they will need to apply for this pre-approval. And it's an automated digital, it's not a visa, it's just an automated digital approval. Um, and it should be the plan, nice and easy, quick, online, only going to cost £10. So again, kind of nominal value. And, and when that's approved, that will be digitally linked to the passport. So it will be valid for two years, or if the passport expires earlier, then it would need to be renewed at that point. Um, we're still going to see how this rolls out. So it's being introduced in the UK in phases. So the first sort of tranche of people that comes into force in October, there's some more in November, and the plan is by the end of, of 2024, all known visa nationals, including US and Europeans, for example, will be subject to these ETA requirements. Um, I think 
the, the kind of practical headaches I can foresee is just the planning that's needed. So it might take longer. So like you say, don't, don't book your flight until you have this sorted. Um, keep a copy of it. So even though it's digital, Home Office digital systems don't have a great track record in the UK. So take a print out to the airport just so you can have the conversation if you need to. Um, and, I, and again, just if anybody does have any convictions or immigration breaches on their record, it, because it's automated, that's that's likely to lead to an automatic refusal. So you want to make sure that that works through the system. You have time to then submit the visa application because you would then need to make a visa application for the UK. So it's quite a change. The UK has never had this before. Um, it is quite a shift for us to kind of strengthen border security, but it's just worth keeping an eye on that. And I suppose as a business, kind of planning ahead and making sure people are prepared for, for what they have to do. And I think that's a great nugget because I know that often U.S. nationals um, just think that they can show up with a passport, you know. Um, and so mm -hmm. if the EPA is being rolled out, I, mm -hmm. I think the advice would be make sure you're getting on the website, make sure you're checking what the requirements yeah. are, um, because the last thing you want is to make that, you know, 10 hour flight to Heathrow mm -hmm. and be told you, you don't have the proper paperwork. So. Yeah. Um, so what happens if someone breaches the rules? What happens if, you know, the UK government finds out that a US national has showed up to the UK and is engaging in day-to-day -day duties on UK soil? Yeah. What does that look like? The biggest risk would, um, well, it depends whether there's a business presence in the UK or not, if there's an actual entity there. Um, the individual has a lot of risk there. They would be illegally working in the UK potentially, so they can have criminal liabilities. Obviously, that's a really big black mark in an immigration record, so that's going to cause them real issues for future visa applications, future requests to come into the UK. Um, if there is a UK business that's received that person, which maybe they've come in to visit, to work with, whether that's a group company or not, um, they could be considered to be employing that person illegally, and then you get into really quite hefty penalties. So there's potential criminal liability of um, you know, custodial sentences and unlimited fines. That's more remote. In the UK, our biggest enforcement route is civil liabilities, which is really enforces a kind of strict liability. Um, and at the moment, that's up to £20,000 per legal worker, but that's increasing next year to £60,000 per legal worker. So the, the government's really placing more focus on kind of breaches of visa rules in the UK and, and working illegally. Um, and I guess for the wider business overseas uh, there's kind of reputational risks that go with that and it could obviously create your problems if you then in the future want to expand to the UK get a license to employ migrant workers or you know anything like that any immigration applications it could just cause you headaches so it's definitely something you know people always say to me well what are the chances of them actually finding out that you know I'm doing something and yeah they can run the gauntlet they can run the risk but when it goes wrong it can really go wrong and I don't think as an employer or business you obviously want to be kind of supporting and encouraging that because also if you've com committed to meetings or contracts or whatever work in the UK, um, you're going to have to explain to somebody eventually why you can't deliver on that if your team can't come and do the job. So, yeah, it's one to be careful of. What about the States? Any horror stories over it's there? Very, very similar. Um, so there, there is, I think, for the individual, there is always that risk of, you know, being found out. Um, having the ESTA or the visitor's visa revoked, mm -hmm. um, certain bars going into place for re-entry. So in the event that Department of Homeland Security or uh, Customs and Border Protection realizes that your, your mm -hmm. intent is to kind of come stay work uh, unlawfully, they mm -hmm. will revoke your, your ability to travel back and forth. And then trying to get some sort of permission to re-enter at whatever point, it's going to be almost impossible. I mean, it's possible, but um, being kind of blacklisted, as you said, is, is a, definitely a real thing. Um, and then I think the same goes for employers. So, um, you know, employers do get, get a reputation in the immigration law enforcement sector in the U.S. And so if you are someone that's invited an individual to enter um, and work unlawfully, not only will you likely be barred from uh, any sort of, you know, invitation of foreign nationals moving forward, um, but also there will be possible civil and criminal penalties 
um, as it pertains to employment of um, un unauthorized workers. So it's a it's a big headache. I would say don't do, don't do it. Um, avoid it. And you know something that I always recommend um, for for my clients is if if you're a U.S. company that is wanting to invite a foreign national from the UK, um, provide them with a letter, you know, provide them with a letter that essentially outlines the invitation, produces an agenda, um, you know, from day one to four, they're gonna be conducting, you know, business meetings with associates at site A from day four to seven, um, they're gonna be negotiating contracts. Um, so that we're really, we're really setting the foundation of the entry and that the, the work that is gonna be conducted kind of fits within those rules. Yeah, and I think that's a really good tip because in the UK, we would generally say they say, we want to have a really clear agenda. These are your travel dates that you're definitely, you have booked on a flight to go home ideally. Um, and we'd often say, have the overseas employer send a letter, like you've just outlined, setting out what they're doing and why. Some, we quite often say, have a letter of invitation from the UK business or client, you know, even if it is just attending meetings, just to kind of back all of that up. And a key tip is just make sure your employees on message, because the number of times we know the person's coming in to do something that's legitimately permitted by the visitor rules, and the, you know, the business knows that, they're not straying out with that, but when questioned at the border, what are you coming in to do? Well, I'm coming in to work for a month. <laughs> no, you're not. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. And then they're sent away. So making sure that they can have their own message and have almost a script of what to say and what not to say is mm -hmm. the battle as well. Um, yeah. And I think for those of you um, that don't work with Joe or I, if, if and when you are wanting some sort of template, um, I, I think we both have templates that we're, we're happy to kind of float around um, for those invitation letters. So feel free to reach out. Um, all right, what about remote working? Did you get tons of questions? I mean, I feel like starting with COVID, um, I, every day I was writing emails to clients mm -hmm. about what it looks like to employ someone abroad or in a remote type capacity. Are, are, were you fielding those same questions in the UK? I think so. And I think as well, COVID showed that pre-COVID, everybody was just doing what they wanted and not checking if it was lawful or okay. Yes, <laughs> and then when we started to question it, going, well, hang on, we're all doing hybrid and remote working. Um, yeah, so we do get questions quite a lot about, you know, where I want to come and, you know, less people, I would say, have a holiday house in the UK than the south of France, let's be honest. But yeah. um, you might have people coming over wanting to work here while they're holidaying. And the guidance is quite limited on it. So it is permitted to come here for a legitimate reason. So maybe as a tourist or, or for other legitimate business reasons that are permitted. And if you're generally fielding some calls and emails while you're here, that's okay. I think where the Home Office in the UK get uncomfortable is if that takes over and becomes all you're doing. So if it becomes, again, coming back to the intent and the purpose of your visit, if the main purpose and the main time that you're spending in the UK is just doing your job remotely from the UK, that's where it's going to become a problem. And again, you'd want that visit to be quite short term to kind of manage those risks. So I think if you're here really frequently, really successively or long term, and you're just kind of plugging in your laptop and working from the UK, that's where it becomes riskier. And if the Home Office find out or you were challenged by a, a Border Force officer, they can start to say, well, who's doing your role in the US or wherever you're coming from? You know, what's happening to that job overseas and can kind of start to challenge you? So it is still a bit vague here um, and it, we're still kind of finding our way through it, but it's definitely an increasing phenomenon that people want to do this. So can I, um, when I visit London, can I respond to emails? Is that fine? <laughs> okay. Yes. So you don't go off the hips from working, Christine, while you're here fully. Yeah. So I, I think that in the U.S. it's it's um, it's kind of similar, slightly different. So so again, you know, if someone from the U.K. is taking their family to Disneyland um, and is checking emails from their hotel room in the morning mm -hmm. before the, I mean, it's more or less going to be okay. Um, because yeah. again, going back to the intent, the intent really is the vacation, it's the holiday, it's it's not coming here to work. Um, if, if you're planning or if a UK national is planning on essentially relocating for the US to the US and plugging in and working from home mm -hmm. or 
a co-working space, just don't do it, right? Because that gets us back into um, the the uncharted waters of working on U.S. soil without authorization. Um, the other thing that I will note is for those employers who are looking to hire remote individuals abroad but in their home country so for example i know that i fielded a lot of questions from u.s employers that were interested in um, employing a uk national in the uk mm -hmm. um, I, what i would say is i for, for from an immigration perspective that that's probably fine um, but you're still going to need to connect with local council on things like taxes, you know, and what taxes look like, um, things like benefits and the specific employment laws, if there are corporate considerations that we need to be thinking about. Um, so kind of keep that in mind um, for those of you on the call who are are considering hiring foreign nationals abroad in their home country. Um, it's not always as easy as just hiring someone in Northern Ireland um, who is a national of the country. Um, you, you probably will want to connect with a uh, council in the specific country to make sure that all of the other areas of law outside of immigration um, are were in compliance with. Yeah, completely the same from this perspective as well. That's, that's exactly the advice I'd be giving you. All right, so I guess for those folks who don't necessarily fit under the business visitor slash ESTA ETA yep. world that need to actually get visas, what, what would be the recommendations? What are kind of your thoughts and how do you walk clients through that, that yeah. uh, option process? So there's a kind of a multitude of potential visa options in the UK. I'm going to narrow it down to the four in the slide today because I would have to keep you all day to probably cover all of them. But these are the main go-tos. If you're in that situation of, I've got someone I need to send to the UK, it's more substantive than a visitor can do, and I just need something a bit more. These are the main routes that we're going to go to. Um, so we've got the skilled worker, the senior specialist worker, graduate trainee or UK expansion worker, the GBM that's referenced on the slide references global business mobility routes. And that's a kind of umbrella category of visas. So these are three of the visas that fall under that, that category. Um, the one thing to note about all of these visa options is that they need you to have a UK entity that holds a sponsor license. So that means that the entity is applied to the Home Office, being vetted and approved to employ migrant workers in the UK. That in itself is a bit of a process. So you want to build in the time scales and the cost for that, which I'll, I'll come on to briefly. But in terms of what these categories are for, so the skilled worker is for a skilled worker to come to the UK. They've got a job offer from a UK entity. Senior or specialist worker is replaced what we used to call an intra-company transfer visa. So essentially for multinationals who have got overseas group staff that they want to temporarily second to a UK group company, that's the route that you can use. Graduate trainees, similar overseas group staff that are coming as part of a specialist training program to get them to kind of managerial or a specialist um, position. UK expansion worker has replaced what we used to call the sole rep visa. So that's basically um, if you want to expand your business to the UK, you don't have a, you're not trading in the UK at the moment and you want to expand and have a presence, you can now send over people under this route to kind of help you get that off the ground. What I would say is the expansion worker one is a much more complex license application to make. There's more scope for a challenge from the Home Office. It's much more document heavy. Um, so the skilled worker or senior specialist worker will be much more straightforward in that scenario. And so, for example, I've just helped a US private equity fund get their first skilled worker license to set up in the UK and get their team over. And we looked at UK expansion worker, but actually it was just much easier, long term, more cost effective and efficient to wait till they're at a stage in the UK that we had the paperwork that we needed to go straight for the license, which ultimately you're going to have to go for anyway. UK expansion worker is really just a two year plan and then you have to move to one of the other routes in any event. So there's a bit of process, there's a lot of compliance with these routes in the UK. That's the joy of a sponsor license. Um, you can have given a lot of responsibility with it. Um, the skilled worker visa is the only one that has an English language threshold mainly because it's the only one of these routes that can lead to indefinite leave to remain in the UK and in turn eventually citizenship in the UK. So your US nationals will automatically meet English language requirements. 
certain other nationalities will have to pass them. Um, now, they might be able to do that through their education achievements. If they meet the requirements, they might have to set an English language test. They all have skills thresholds. The skilled worker route has a lower skill threshold, so a much wider range of roles will qualify for that visa. The other routes are all higher skilled and aimed at kind of work pitched at degree level people. Um, whenever you come to sponsor somebody in any of these routes, you'll need to pin down a specific job code for their role. That will dictate, is it skilled enough to qualify for this visa? And then in turn, it dictates the minimum salary that's applicable. So I've put the minimum salary criteria for each visa route on the slide there. They're all subject to a higher going rate if there is one for that particular job code. So you do want to kind of like iron all those points out and just make sure that the individual and the role actually qualifies for the visa. The GBM routes all have a prior service requirement. So unless they're a high earner, they all need to have um, a year's service outside the UK, three months for the graduate trainee UX route. So it's an existing employee that you're sending over to the UK. Um, and they're all temporary routes with the exception of the skilled worker route, which you can now extend indefinitely. So you can get up to five years. You can keep rolling that over, but bearing in mind that that is the only route where after five years, if you meet the continuous residence requirements in the UK, you can apply for indefinite leave to remain. So that can let you settle. And once you've had settled status for 12 months, you could seek British citizenship if you wanted to, and if your home country allowed you to do that. So that's a real kind of canter through the main routes, but these are really the go-tos. I would say that post-Brexit skilled worker is by far the route that's being used the most. And actually the, the number of businesses applying for sponsor licenses in the UK has just absolutely rocketed since Brexit and the COVID. I think COVID slightly dampened the Brexit impacts and now we've just seen that take off. So processing time skills and everything are, are slightly slower. Um, just to kind of quickly touch on what that looks like process wise, the routes I've just covered are all sponsored. There's a kind of three stage process to that. So you need to, as I mentioned, get your sponsorship license. So that's an online application to the home office where you're vetted. You have to provide certain mandatory evidence about your business to show that you should get that license. Um, with the exception of the expansion worker route, you'll need to have at least one UK based member of staff or office holder that's a settled worker because there are certain <coughs> mandatory compliance rules that they have to fill. And the license is generally about, um, it's either five, about £500 if you're a small company, just under 1500 if you're a large company to pay for. Um, and you usually allow about four to six weeks for that license process in itself. So we'll quite often get clients say, I need someone in in four weeks, and they have no license and none of this in place. So you want to build in the kind of process here. Once you have the license, you can then sponsor them. So we, this, the cause, as we've put there, the certificate of sponsorship, is that digital process of sponsoring the individual. You'll have to pay various fees at that point to be able to sponsor them. That gives them a unique reference number, and they need that to then complete the final stage, which is when they apply for their visa. Now, that's an online application. They will attend to provide their biometrics and then be granted their visa to come in. Um, I won't outline all the costs today, but it's just to flag that they are increasing. So from next month, the costs in the UK are going up between 15 and 20 percent, largely to fund public sector pay rises in the UK. Um, your certificate of sponsorship um, is currently £199. That's going up. Um, your immigration skills charge is payable in most cases for MD that you sponsor, and that's £1,000 per year paid up front. Um, they then have the visa fees paid by the individual, and then they have to pay an immigration health surcharge um, to help fund the NHS. And that's, again, per year. So that at the moment, that's £624 per year, but that's increasing to over £1,000. So quite significant jumps. So we're seeing more employers look at things like clawback arrangements and protections they can get in place. So if they incur all these costs and then someone leaves six months later, the business has got a bit of protection. And there are non-sponsored options, so time doesn't permit us to go into them. But if you're ever looking at somebody where well, we just can't get a license or for whatever reason we can't meet the requirements of those routes, we'd always dig around into that person's circumstances and think, does that actually open the door to maybe another option? Could they get a dependence visa if their other half's coming in, for example? And that might be cheaper, bring a lot less compliance, but they tend to be shorter term visas. Um, so yeah, quite a lot of kind of processing compliance and costs to weigh up when you're getting into the world of, of sponsored work visas. Um, how does that shape up compared to the States? I know you've got a raft of options out there as well, Christine. 
Oh yeah, we there there are so many options. Um, in the immigration world, we we refer to the the different types of visas as alphabet soup because there literally are visas for basically every single letter of the alphabet. Um, what I will tell you is that it, it is somewhat similar and that there are various steps that have to be taken. Um, so for for those UK nationals who were hoping to hire in the US, um, the, the US entity first has to submit an application with the US Department of Homeland Security. That application has to be approved. Um, and then the UK national needs to book an appointment with the US consulate abroad. So then we have to move to the US Department of State and everything that they're looking for. Um, and then only upon the appointment and the US Department of State believing that the person is telling the truth and staying consistent with the application that was submitted, um, do they actually issue the passport visa stamp? Um, and then from there, the, the UK national will have to enter the US. And so there's another level of scrutiny with US Customs and Border Protection. Um, you know, again, making sure that the intent of the specific visa that they're on is uh, relayed correctly upon entry at the port. So it is, there are multiple steps and we are working with multiple agencies and trying to balance the interests of each agency because although this, it, they're all an attempt to get this one single visa, oftentimes what we find is that each of the agencies kind of weigh or stress things different than the other. So it's, it's definitely a balancing game that we have to play. Um, I will tell you for, for the UK nationals that I work with, these are, these are the majority of the visas that we see. Um, you know, I, I know that Prince Harry, for example, is in the US on an A visa, um, or what we assume is he's here in the US on an A visa. But for the most part, most of the foreign nationals we work with um, that are UK nationals come in on one of these. Um, I'll kind of just run through them in order. I think it may be easiest that way. Um, please feel free to make sure that you're dropping questions, comments, thoughts um, in the chat. Uh, I know that Joe and I tried to make this presentation as casual and um, not slide heavy as possible so that we can kind of engage with you all and make sure that we're, we're answering questions that you have. Um, so I guess I'll start with the H-1B. Um, the H-1B is likely the visa type that you hear about the most often um, when it comes to U.S. immigration. Historically, it's kind of been like the gateway visa. Um, it is reserved for those individuals who are going to be assuming some sort of specialty occupation. And in the U.S., what a specialty occupation means is that the individual has at least a bachelor's degree in a specific field and that the position that they're being hired for requires that specific bachelor's degree. So I often like to give the example of like a civil engineer. Um, more often than not, a civil engineering type role is going to require a degree in civil engineering and the individual who is assuming the role will have a civil engineering degree. Um, the problem with the H-1B visas is that they're subject to a lottery. Um, and in years past, there have been way more applicants for H-1Bs than there are H-1Bs available. But last year, we saw um, about 800,000 applicants for the lottery for about 85,000 visas. So the probability of being selected in the lottery is just slim. Um, the other thing I will say is that there is a prevailing wage. Um, so similar to, I think, a lot of the UK's types and routes. Um, but these prevailing wages are, um, they're based on the metropolitan area that the foreign national will be working in and then the, the role that they will be assuming. Um, so those prevailing wages we submit and we get confirmation from the U.S. Department of Labor on a case-by-case -case basis. We don't necessarily know what that wage will be super far in advance, um, but 
you know, in the event that you are considering some sort of foreign national for an H-1B visa, we can generally give you a pretty good idea of where we will land with the wage if, if that takes place. So anyway, for those, for those individuals that could fit in the H-1B category, I think it's a good option. But again, um, it's a bit of an uphill battle because of the lottery. Um, the other type of visa we see really often, especially as it pertains to UK nationals, is the L-1. Uh, the L-1 is an intercompany transferee. And I know that um, Joe kind of made mention of those intercompany transferees. We have two types of intercompany transferees that we work with, the first being um, multinational executives, directors, managers, um, usually individuals that have uh, direct reports. Um, you, we'd like those direct reports to also be professionals. And in the US, when we say professionals, we mean at least a bachelor's degree. Um, and in the event that they don't have direct reports, we can also sometimes make arguments that they're managing a specific function of the company. Uh, in in comparison, we also have the L1B, um, which is reserved for those individuals with specialized knowledge. So again, if you are a multinational company um, and you have uh, individuals who you would like to move over from an entity abroad, we can usually make the argument that they have specialized knowledge if they do, right? So we're, we're often in our L1B saying, hey, there is no one in the U.S. with this experience. Um, we have proprietary processes. We have patented equipment. Um, we need individuals that have worked pretty extensively with our organization to be able to make sure they hit the ground running. Um, the one thing I will tell you about L1s is that the individual does have to be employed by an affiliate or a subsidiary abroad for at least one of the three years prior to us submitting the application. So they have to have some sort of tenure with the organization abroad before we can even think about um, you know, moving them to the entity in the US. Um, E2 visas, really quickly, these are reserved for treaty investors. Um, so individuals who are investing a substantial amount of capital, um, usually these are a bit more of a lift in that um, we are going to want to see some sort of business plan. We're going to want to see funds and escrow. Um, but the E2 that we do probably see more often is for those employees um, of E2 treaty investors. So if we have a company abroad, let's say it's a UK based company, and we have a UK national um, who is planning to come over to the US to engage in some sort of managerial um, activity, let's say, um, oftentimes we can get them in as an E2 on an E2 visitors visa. Um, all right, O1s, aliens of extraordinary ability. This is one that we're seeing a lot more of. Um, historically, they have been reserved for individuals like um, David Beckham and Justin Bieber and Rihanna. Um, but we are seeing them now more and more, um, especially in the corporate space. The thing to be aware of with O1s is that we really have to show that the individual has risen to the very top of whatever their specific field is. Um, it is a bit more of a subjective category where we get to make more creative arguments as to why the person is an alien of extraordinary ability. Um, and there is a higher level of proof. Um, but in, you know, I think the last three years, we've seen a lot of really great success, both in the corporate space and the higher education space. Um, in securing these O-1 visas. And often when an individual doesn't qualify for an H or an L or an E, um, we look to the O to see if there are some kind of fun and creative arguments that we can make uh, to, to secure an O-1 for them. Uh, I know I'm talking a lot. Um, so two more things really quick and then I'll stop. Um, permanent residence. Uh, just something to be aware of. It is an option. If the intent of the business is to get an individual here right now, um, it may not be the best option. 
Um, we may want to figure out an option to get them into the U.S. and working first. Um, and then from there, work on getting them their permanent residency. Um, there are situations where we do work on permanent residency while the foreign national is abroad, um, but those those um, instances are kind of rare and few and far between. Happy to talk to any and all of you about those options if and when permanent residency comes up. Um, just keep in mind that U.S. immigration is really volatile. Um, it is very, very policy-based. Um, and I tell people, I tell my associates, I tell my clients, it's it's often like being an immigration attorney in the U.S. is often like working on an engine of a car and the car is running is what it feels like. Um, and, you know, something that we tell you today may be totally different in 2024 um, based on what the administration looks like, who the president is, what his cabinet looks like, um, what the, their immigration agenda is. Um, so just keep that in mind as you're kind of navigating whether or not U.S. immigration is, um, is something that makes sense for your organization. Obviously, we do our best to keep our finger on the pulse um, and to, and, you know, I, I think me and my team have been, um, clients have told us that we are bulldozers moving desks because often, you know, like in, in the previous administration, we had to be really aggressive and, and we had really good success. But just keep in mind that what immigration looks like under the Biden administration may look very different than what immigration looks like under the next administration. So with that, I will stop talking. I think I think that mirrors the position in the UK as well. I mean, it's, it's so political. So it changes so frequently for us to keep on top of the rules. Um, and yeah, we've obviously, we're still sort of recovering from the, the, the Brexit fallout and the massive changes for Europe that that's created. But yeah, it's definitely fast paced and changes all the time. Um, yeah. Yeah. So I think we have one question about the validity on an H-1B. So the H-1B is good for a total of six years um and it but it's broken up into two three-year increments so you can ideally extend outside of that six years but in order to do that you have to engage in that permanent residence process that i talked about towards the end um, and be able to prove to the u.s department of labor and to immigration that there is no willing and qualified U.S. worker that's able to do the job. So generally speaking, rule of thumb, good for a total of six years, two, three-year increments, possibility to extend outside of that six years, but there are additional responsibilities and liabilities that the employer has to take on to be able to do that. We've also got a question about um, just whether visitors can come into the UK and then switch to one of the business categories that I covered. And that is something that comes up quite often, particularly where you see maybe businesses are slightly caught out by the UK rules and hadn't appreciated we need to get a sponsor license and you know we need to go through all this process before we can even apply for the visa. Um, so US nationals, to take an example, can absolutely come in as a visitor. What you can't do is switch once you're in the UK to one of those sponsored work visas. So you would always need to leave the UK, go back home and reapply when you're in a position to do so. So it's quite common for say US execs to come over, look at properties, find out where you want your business premises to be or to do meetings in advance of a role in the UK, but they can't actually kind of set up tools and do work until they've gone back home and reapplied. So that's quite a common theme that comes up to try and save time, get them on the ground early, but it's yeah, not not a, a one to go with, unfortunately. We see that a lot in the US too, um, where they come in on ESTA or they come in on a B visitor's visa mm -hmm. and then they want to switch to, you know, an E2. Um, and we tell them like, oh, wait, hold on. <laughs> Your intent at the border was one thing, right? Yeah, so absolutely. if we file absolutely. this now and you're here, there, there's going to be questions about whether you're honest or intent or not. Mm -hmm. um, 
We have one other question about E2 visas and what the validity is on those E2s. So E2s can be issued anywhere from two years to five months, um, sorry, two months to five years. Uh, and they can be extended indefinitely, but there has to be that business need in order to extend them. Um, so two months to five years, usually about the two year mark is how they issue them um, and they can be renewed. So uh, anything else on your end, Joe? Um, yeah, another one, just a, a quick one that's come up is just whether directors, so it'll be quite common that you'll have maybe a director based in the States um, coming over for directors board meetings um, in the UK. We have that kind of standard rule that you can't be employed or paid in the UK. There are limited carve outs for um, reasonable expenses. So the question has been asked about whether they can receive their director's fees for attending a board meeting in the UK. And that is one of the, the permitted instances where they can get payment. So that comes up sometimes that the UK yeah. business will get quite nervous about them coming in and being paid for that. But that's a, that's a permitted expense for them. Uh, all right. Here's a here's a juicy question. Does a US green card holder have the ability to leave the country for more than six months in a 12 month period? And I'm going to say that depends, which is <laughs> I know the worst answer. Um, so so the rules around US permanent residents um, are very, very specific and really, really nuanced. And really, the intent of um, being a permanent resident in the U.S. is that you actually are a permanent resident, meaning that you're here for more than half of the year. So mm -hmm. in the event that a green card holder or a permanent resident leaves the U.S. for more than six months, there's a whole litany of things that we have to look at. Um, one, to decide whether or not they've abandoned their permanent residency. Um, and then two, also to decide whether or not they've essentially disqualified themselves possibly from U.S. citizenship, if that's something that they're interested in. Um, at the end of the day, being a permanent resident in the U.S. doesn't, you know, tie you to the U.S. You're still free to leave and travel um, as appropriate, uh, but there may be certain immigration implications if your primary domicile isn't the U.S. and you're not spending a full portion of the year um, here and on, on U.S. soil. Are there similar sorts of instances with UK considerations? Yeah, yeah I was just going to say this. So the skilled worker visa is the main one that leads to indefinitely to remain in the UK. Um, and if you're on that visa, if you're out for more than six months of any 12 months, and that's a rolling 12 months, so it's no longer a calendar year, then that breaks your continuity of residence. So um, it can impact your ability to settle. So we always kind of say to people, just keep a really close eye on your business travel and your holidays. And people, if they're wanting to get to settlement in the UK, they tend to be quite switched on and they do keep, a, keep tabs on this. But you just want to keep a check because it can mean you're just having to extend that visa more than you otherwise would need to in delaying citizenship if that is the end goal for somebody that they want to get to. Um, so, yeah, that's a tricky one to keep an eye on. Yeah, yeah, very similar. Well, thank you, everyone, so much for joining. Um, again, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, Joe and I are here. We are happy to be sounding boards for you. Um, uh, the firm has given me another tiny little script to read, so I'm going to do that. Um, but seriously, call us, email us. Um, if anything comes up, we're, we're always happy to be resources. Um, so again, thank you for joining us today. We hope the information was helpful and um, to you and your organization. As a reminder, uh, the program has been approved for legal education hours. To report your hours, click on the CEU icon at the bottom of the screen. A certificate of attendance, including course numbers and including course numbers will be emailed to you tomorrow along with a recording of the webcast for all of you to watch again. Um, to watch and share. Be sure to complete our short survey. Uh, we will use your feedback to plan future programs that are applicable to your business needs. This concludes our webinar. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you.